Modern marketing changes fast, and great marketers need an edge. Marketers from challenger brands need to be especially brave. This season, all our guests are from challenger brands. Join us as they unveil the strategies and tactics behind the risks that they've taken. They'll talk about the biggest, boldest marketing campaigns that got their brand noticed and made an impact in the industry. Hosted by Brave Software and me, Donnie DeVorn, head of sales at Brave. Join me to get fresh, new perspectives and the inspiration to say yes to Brave marketing moments. Welcome to the first episode of season three. We're really excited to be back in your ears. In this season, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to focus on challenger brands. Challenger brands are usually newer companies, many of the times DTC, direct to consumer, but not always, but they're really challenging the status quo. They're not any of these brands that have been around for 50 or 100 years. They're usually newer brands. And with that, they have two challenges because if you're talking to Kraft, Unilever, Procter & Gamble and one of the brands there, people already know about their brands. So it's more about their campaigns that are standing out or how they're thinking about privacy and third party cookies. With challenger brands, they need to get their company out into the market and they also need to get the actual brand and the product that they're selling in, into the market. So they have a dual goal, which I think makes it even harder to do marketing at those brands to really stand out because there's so many new and upcoming challenger brands. And so we're going to focus on those. And I think you're really going to like the stories that you're going to hear because they do have to stand out. And to kick off this season, we're going to talk to Helen, who leads marketing and communications at AngelList. Now, Helen spent the last 12 years leading marketing at Plaid, Quora, Dropbox, and even Facebook. And prior to working in tech, Helen worked in the advertising industry managing automotive and technology clients for Venables Bell and Partners and Young and Rubicon. In today's episodes, just some quick takeaways that I thought that you're going to like is that we talked about moving from regular conference events to virtual events and some best practices to increase engagement. We talked about growth programs that are aimed at existing customers instead of acquiring new users. We talked about investing in community and lifecycle marketing to stay on top of mind for consumers and then measuring ad units across all different audience. But before we get to today's episode, we want to highlight our Brave Pick of the Week. So every episode, we choose a brand that has run an ad campaign with Brave. And today we're going to be talking about Yubico. So Yubico is the number one security key for strong two-factor, multi-factor, and passwordless authentication. And they ran push notifications to increase brand awareness and to drive users to their website and that found really good success with us. So finally, please help me in welcoming the pie maker extraordinaire, Buffalo sports fan, creator of the fundraiser and founder of Equal Justice Initiative, and author of the blog, Have Your Cake and Eat It Too. Helen, welcome to the Brave Marketer Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, we're excited to have you on. As I mentioned in my intro, you have so much great backgrounds in all the companies that you've worked for in the past, and we really want to dive into that. But let's start with you right now. What's the most exciting thing that you're working on at this present moment? Well, right now, we're busy preparing for the sixth annual Angelist Confidential Conference. So once again, because we're still in a pandemic, uh, it'll be a virtual event spanning three days, and it's packed with content and insights and big names in VC and a lot of hot takes. So we're really excited about this year's program that's consuming all of our time right now. Talk to me about how doing virtual conferences has differed from the actual in-person events. There's a couple of obvious things, but I would love to hear it in your opinion. Yeah, no, it's a great question and definitely one on everyone's minds. I think a year ago, as we started to lock down and in our 2020 event marketing plans were all being crumbled up and we had to rethink the year. I think the biggest thing and most obvious thing is you don't have a venue or fancy decorations and the big production to hide behind. So it's really your content front and center. I think I've always been somebody who believes that events are really just a channel by which you deliver great content, great messaging. But I think there are so many variables that, that go into a great event, a great attendee experience that you just can't hide behind them. <laughs> so this means that teams are really getting back to core principles of messaging. What value are you providing? What valuable insights can they take away? You know, you don't have the fancy food and drinks and you know, the fun party and the live band and the gift bags and all these things that I think are, are important parts of what makes a great event experience. You know, you just really have to go back to the content. 
So both of us have been on the B2B marketing or sales side of conferences where we're trying to get leads and, and really create relationships with people. So when we get back to our offices, it's, oh, remember when we were at the bar and we were talking about X, Y, and Z. Is there a way or have you seen people recreate that at all virtually? So we tried a couple ways. So I think early pandemic, we were definitely in this sort of, let's test and learn. Let's see what sticks because nobody has a playbook that's working just yet. So we're all going to be creating our own playbooks. We're all going to see if we find magic in the different experiments that we try. So we tried some panels. We had an interactive component where people could ask panelists questions. And then that sort of allowed them to see each other's names and network. Angel is Confidential last year, we had dedicated breakout sessions at the end of each day where we invited our customers to join the Zoom, and then we randomly separated them into different breakout rooms with an Angelist team member in the room to moderate conversation. Opportunities to network, I don't think it's the same as being able to just meet somebody face to face at a conference or, or see somebody you're sitting next to and you're watching the same program. I think that we're getting creative in ways to allow people to connect. So I'm familiar with Angelist. I've been in the startup world for a while, but for those people listening who don't already know Angelus, can you just take a minute and share a bit about the business and what you do as an organization? Absolutely. So Angelist is the leading platform for early stage venture investing. Angelus gives people the opportunity to participate in the venture economy. So that means that uh, people can invest in startups. It's no longer something that is you know, happening uh, behind closed doors, just through, you know, a legacy network, uh, having to know somebody who knows somebody. This also allows more startups to get the resources they need to change the world. So we offer products and services to fund managers. So those are people who want to start a fund or syndicate. Investors, people who invest into those funds or syndicates. And of course, founders. And you've worked for some big brands that people know outside the Valley, like Quora, Dropbox, Facebook. What enticed you or drew you to AngelList? Yeah, so I joined AngelList just a couple of weeks after the new CEO came in. And I think that when I look back at my career, I'd be lying if I say, oh, I knew Facebook would be really big when I joined, or I knew Dropbox was going to be big, or Plaid. I think Plaid is a, is a great example of one that I think people had not heard of right when I joined them. And with AngelList, I saw that there was a really exciting opportunity for them to pivot the business and really get crisp on exactly the value they provide at this moment in time where I think angel investing, startup investing is becoming very popular. And through the pandemic, one thing that we saw was people got into investing and there were not as many other activities for them to participate in and network. I think with Zoom, startups being able to pitch themselves to investors, investors being able to see and hear a lot more startup pitches from the comfort of their own homes rather than driving around and finding coffee meeting here and there. It accelerated the growth of this industry that already was growing two years ago. So I think seeing that it was going to be a really interesting time with new leadership and new focus was just a really exciting opportunity for me to see like how marketing could play a role in that. You've been there, for, like you said, for just about two years. What are some of the biggest changes or campaigns you've been responsible for leading that have made the most impact? Yeah. When the CEO started, what we talked about from a go-to-market standpoint, there were two big priorities at the time. The first was changing the business model from carry to fees. So carry is how traditional venture firms make money, make carry on the fund. Changing the business model to fees, particularly through a product called rolling funds, allowed us to have more predictable, recognizable revenue on a quarterly basis, which allowed us to invest back into the business and create a high growth. And then the second objective that we had was to pivot Angelus as a well-loved 10-year-old startup community brand to a trusted financial services brand. So I'd say every marketing initiative and campaign in the last two years has been in service to one or both of these two priorities. We immediately changed pricing and policies to support and scale a growth engine and sort of scale the network effects that were already happening on the platform. We spent a lot of time connecting the dots backwards and helping make sense of every product launch over the past 10 years in, in different stories, we used owned and earned media to refine and amplify those company stories. A big part of that was last year we launched Angelist.com. See, Angelus was a Angelus is a still it's a holding company as well, and it has Angelus Venture, Angelus Talent, Product Hunt, which you probably heard of, um, Republic, Coinlist, and so Angelus.com was the first time we would be able to tell the very venture specific story to our specific of investors and founders. And to do this, we invested heavily in content, not only the blog but our, also our new venture education center, because we think Angelus really has this opportunity to be the definitive place for people to learn about venture capital. One challenge, though, if for any of you out there who have launched a new website is that 
we are competing with our own old website. <laughs> so angel.co is, is 10 years old and has still a lot of great content. So for Google, we're almost competing with ourselves for domain authority. It's getting better and better every month. And I don't think this will be a problem for that much longer, but it's a real challenge. It's funny. <laughs> As many of our listeners know, the Brave Marketer podcast is all about a brave marketing moment when the marketers that we interview did something special, risky, and exhibited bravery. So Helen, for you, what would you define as your brave marketing moment from your career? Yeah, I think just because we're talking so much about AngelList right now and the conference being top of mind, it takes me back to about a year and a half ago at the start of the pandemic where companies like ours that rely so heavily on their communities, community engagement. The Angelus community is a huge differentiator. It's a unique differentiator for us in our space. And these in-person programs were very meaningful. Every quarter, we would do five cities in person, bring the community together, and in addition to that annual a large-scale event in San Francisco. And I think it was around February where we're just looking at the case rates and looking at the writing on the wall for what was going to happen next when offices started to close. We had to make a call. If you're an event that to plan a large event, six month lead time is sort of the minimum um, for that. So, you know, do we cancel the venue that we already booked? It's just sort of like figuring out what to do from there when putting everything on pause was not really going to be an option. So, I'd say the the brave moment was just taking one thing at a time and figuring out like what we're going to try and helping the company feel comfortable with like that we've never done this before, but it's not an option for us to sit out. So, we're going to try some things and. Some of it's not going to work. I'd say the biggest one there was the decision to put Angel as Confidential online. And we really leaned into the online format and said, okay, what does being online, being virtual allow us to do that being in person doesn't? And the first one, let's make the conference three days long. Otherwise, it would have been 3x the budget in the past or, or require attendees to carve out three full days of their time. You know, when it's virtual, people can jump in and out of sessions. They can configure the agenda of the, of the conference to make it work for them. So that allow, allowed us to experiment, add a, a lot of new content, a lot of different speakers and formats. And then the second thing that we did was we opened up a handful of sessions to everyone and tested this out as a lead gen opportunity. And we wouldn't have been able to do that in person. There would be space constraints and qualifications and things like that. But we used Twitter. We have a very active Twitter page or Twitter handle and opened this up to anybody who's been following us, interested in venture and just sort of like wanted to see what this was all about, what Angelus was all about, what the conversations were in the venture community. And that was another very worthwhile risk to take. We learned a ton doing this and that largely informed how we approached it this year. Because again, <laughs> we're faced with another virtual event in September. Totally makes sense. One of the quotes from your blog we found was, investing in marketing doesn't always mean hiring a big team and spending a lot of money. I love to know like the genesis of that quote when you first started thinking about that or maybe some examples where you've resourced and came up with something without a lot of marketing dollars. Yeah, thanks. I write some blog posts on my blog when I have time. It was a pandemic hobby for me. And the audience that you know I'm usually speaking to, they're technical founders and investors of very like technical product-centric startups. And I think there is this perception that in order to invest in marketing, you have to have a large team and a large budget. And it's, oh, if we hire one, then we got to hire five or 10, and we're only a five-person company right now, or we've just figured out product market fit. I think there's this perception that you have to go all in with marketing. And so I try to write these blog posts to get founders feeling comfortable with what are the first steps that they can take now, even if there's not a marketing team in place, so that when they eventually do bring in a marketing leader or a full team, that they're setting them up for success. And they're also figuring out a lot of things on their own ahead of time. It's actually been five years since I've had a large team or a large budget, which was my head of enterprise marketing job at Dropbox. So since then, every change that I made or every career change that I made was with a smaller team, a more nimble team that's motivated by problem solving and writing a playbook rather than running it. So how does this show up? I think there's a post about this one too, but it's investing in what I call smart generalists. These are just business-minded athletes who are motivated by solving big strategic problems where like marketing just happens to be a lever for impact versus somebody who's like going to be a career marketer. So that's one way that I think you get a lot of efficiency and can make a large impact with a small team and a small budget. 
I think some other strategies to keep teams small and high impact. I think one that is often overlooked at startups, it's prioritizing growth programs that are aimed at existing customers over acquiring net new. And I think that there's a lot of talk about CAC LTV. There's a lot of talk about efficiencies you're getting from different ad channels. It's something that I think people talk about all the time. And VCs are often asking these questions as well as they evaluate companies. I'm a big believer in investing in community and creating lifecycle programs that keep your product and your company top of mind for your customers as they're growing, especially for companies that have high growth individuals and businesses as customers, because as they grow, your impact on their organization grows as well. And so that looks like I mentioned lifecycle marketing, figuring out how are you incentivizing them to do word of mouth marketing for you? Do you have referral programs? How are you engaging their network into your channel? So I think those are some ways to leverage what you have versus spend a lot of money on acquiring that new. So at Brave, we end up spending a lot of time thinking and talking about privacy. I would love to know how Angelus is thinking about privacy. Yeah, I guess first and foremost, ventures and financial services in the financial industry is like the most highly regulated industry in the country. But most importantly, when it comes to money, trust is paramount. And we take user privacy and confidentiality on the platform very seriously. And so that includes security protocols for logging in and identity verification, KYC, but also communicating our policies regularly and taking swift action when there is a breach of trust. I think the speed in which a company moves and upholds their policies and values is just as important to earning trust as the product or even just being transparent about what the values are. It's the actions that you take against them. Got it. So moving outside of the angel list a little bit, I'd love to hear your kind of bigger picture view about marketing, the advertising industry in general. What do you think is the biggest threat or most pressing challenge we're facing? I think it's the, actually the same challenge that marketers have always faced, which is that there are new frontiers, new channels, and figuring out how to leverage them and how to use them the right way efficiently in a compliant manner. The only difference is right now, I just think that the pace of innovation is faster than ever. So whereas maybe there was a multi-decade time period where TV was the primary channel and then all of a sudden it was like, oh, we have to get used to digital now digital is broken up into 20 different segments within there. And, and I just feel like the frequency in which a marketer is having to learn and onboard how a new channel works, how to communicate with the audience through that channel is just happening more and more frequently. An example that I talk to founders about all the time is a couple of years ago, you know, I was working at Plaid and Brex, which is a, it's like a credit card for startups. They had taken out a bunch of billboards in, in downtown San Francisco, which was genius because that's where all the startups are and that they're marketing to, to startups. And so this caught the attention of every founder, like, oh, should we be doing outdoor advertising as well? And that personally cracked me up because I actually started my career in Chicago doing outdoor advertising. So it was just like, oh, this new medium. Oh, you mean this old one that's been around forever? And so what happened was every founder tried to buy space and then, which drove up demand, drove up prices. And then it became a less efficient channel. So then they got off of <laughs> outdoor advertising and they moved on to radio or they moved on to something else. And so it's just this game that I think that like you, we're working in this industry for a while, you see this just move. And so I think like one thing that has been useful is to just not think in absolutes. Okay, 100% of my budget should never go to one channel. Like it should always be like, a okay, what are the three channels that we generally invest in? What does good look like? What is always on? What are the optimizations that we make? But then also just as important, it's, I think it's just having like, like an experimental culture and a mindset on the team that rewards curiosity and experimentation with new channels. Because I think this is just, it's going to be a requirement for people to just get comfortable with figuring out whether new channels are going to be successful for them. You might miss out on a clubhouse room or TikTok or podcast like this. If you're sort of like, nope, I got my channels. I'm good. I don't want to see what else is out there. Yep. It's, there's so many correlations between investing and marketing spend. Investing, everyone talks about diversification, but you don't want to be too diversified where you got your money in a thousand different areas, but you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. And it's like just what you're saying about market, three different channels, maybe it's five different channels. I think there was a book, John O'Neill, I think is the name that I read so many years ago. And when he was talking about building a stock portfolio, he found that his magic number was owning eight stocks in eight different industries. That was his thing. 
And so everyone's got their number, the number of different marketing channels, but I think you're exactly right. You can't put all your money in billboards and hope that all your marketing problems go away. Totally. I think what's different about channels today is that there is no such thing as set it and forget it. Facebook ads, right? Google ads, like there are these ad consoles, they give you opportunities to upload 20 different versions of creative and they'll like auto optimize what's performing best. It's You really have to pay attention. So I think channel management also requires you to have somebody or a group of people to be paying attention and refreshing creative, making sure things don't get stale. I just don't think that was as much the case before when you think about some traditional channels where it's like, okay, we do a couple campaigns, maybe once or twice a year, and we create all the creative at once, it it ships, and that's it. So I think that's a big difference uh, today as well. Just have to always be paying attention. Somebody's fingers always have to be on the button. Yeah, I think the prior generation of marketers were relying so much on TV, and you'd have your MMA studies, your marketing mix models, and you would get the research back from Nielsen or IRI. Which is an absolute exact science, right? Right. right. (laughs) Yeah, but you'd get it back two months after the TV campaign ended, and then that would inform like two quarters from now. And it's just like when digital came around, it was just like, you can make changes on the fly based on yesterday's data. You can inform tomorrow's creative. Totally. But I think I'm so glad you brought that example up because I think one thing that we're seeing in digital marketing is that because of the sort of immediate nature of being able to measure campaigns, people have this sort of false, there's this fallacy of like precision on how effective something was. So we're going from one extreme to the other where brand advertising in the past, with television, we rely on like these Nielsen studies and maybe products moving off shelf with like six months after the campaign. So it was eh, not an exact science, but everyone knew it. I think digital, particularly like, you know, direct response advertising, because the feedback loop is so immediate, I think people almost fool themselves to say that this is an exact science, like attribution models getting better and better. We can quantify and measure every single thing that we do. And I think that's true. It has limits to an extent. I think we're still moved by big brand campaigns. I think we're still people at the end of the day, and an emotional appeal is still there. It takes time for people to really understand and consider how a brand might impact their lives and whether a product is for them. So I just think that the immediacy and the measurability of a lot of digital channels today almost creates this false sense of security on how exactly their marketing is working. It's more measurable than before, for sure, but I also think that there's an art and intuition and a story that requires a a person to really change their minds about a brand or consider a new brand that I think just can't get sped up at, at the same rate that I think we're, we expect it to. Yeah. Do you think marketers should still be thinking about brand advertising and DR advertising in two separate buckets? And that's okay if you do th- think that way, there's nothing wrong with that. Or is it melted together a little bit more where you've seen just awesome creative or even the medium that it's presented on? Can you accomplish both with one ad or not really? Oh, that's a great question. If you can accomplish one with, accomplish both with one ad. You know, I've seen it work where you've got one team that's fully branded, one team that's fully DR, right? And they like barely intersect. And I've also seen it work where like direct response ads are an integral part of a brand campaign where it's, these are the more short-term metrics that you're paying attention to over the course of like maybe a six to 12 month brand campaign that has digital ads as part of the, the mix as well. So I've seen it work both ways. Could one ad, yeah, I think it absolutely could. It depends on where the customer is in the funnel or in their journey. If you're seeing an ad and it's the second or third time that that prospective customer is hearing from you, then I think it's moving them down the funnel and closer to conversion. Whereas if it's the first time a prospective customer is hearing from you, it's going to take more time. So I think like the real question is, how do you capture the correct measurement for both of those use cases, right? Not bucket them together and think that your ads are working a certain way. So yeah, that's a great question. I'm going to think about that one for a little while after this conversation too. Is that a new way to be efficient, right? An ad that speaks to both and moves people progressively down the funnel, but at different stages. Yeah, we have this challenge on the Brave browser where we have an ad unit called a sponsored image when you hit a new tab. So think of like a homepage takeover. And we say, look, this is a billboard on the side of the highway that happens to be on the Brave browser. But then we allow them in the corner of the ad unit to put 20% off or $20 of Bitcoin when you sign up. So there's like a DR element to it. 
And then as soon as we allow them to have a promotion, they go, oh, this is a DR unit. But we go, no, this is a branding unit. And so it's a challenge. It's it's like really hard because they want to get DR metrics out of a branding unit because we allow them to put a promo. Yeah. The one benefit, I think, as somebody with a very small team that works at small startups, benefit of having smaller teams is you have the same person who can actually look at that holistically and say, hey, we'll see. We'll run this. We'll run that ad unit for a couple of weeks. We'll see whether our audience is responding more to the, the DR component or if we're getting more like brand metrics from it. And then you'll optimize either way. I'm sure you can shut off those components. Whereas if it's a large team you're selling into and then the audiences are, you know, the, the teams are completely siloed, you got to now coordinate across two teams to figure out how to use one ad unit. I can see the complexity there. Yeah, must be a challenge, <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, and what we end up doing is exactly what you're saying. They'll, they'll measure the conversions that they got or they'll do their CAC or CPA analysis but then we'll also run a brand survey before the image ran and right after it ran and show them the lift on intent or awareness or whatever they want to measure. And to your point, it's the same person. So then they can say, look, I got this great lift. My CPA wasn't that great, but I got this great lift or the other way around. It wasn't much of a lift, but you hit all my CAC. It works. Yeah. From early days at Facebook, when we were experimenting with different brand lift studies and we partnered with Nielsen and a lot of those guys too, to figure out like, as we're doing a DR campaign, can we also do a pre-post sort of survey to see like how much does this DR campaign actually impact brand awareness recall in the long term? Yeah, I think that's really... Yeah, I remember the deal that Facebook did with Datalogix early on, and that was all about measuring and not only the lift, but really the lift inside of supermarkets and drugstores and seeing if the Facebook... Yeah, it's been quite a while since I left Facebook, but I do think that now is just a really exciting time to be working in the advertising industry. It's just this experimentation. I always think the best time to join in on a movement or join a company is like when there are a lot of open questions and you're going to be there to do the work to answer some of those questions. I think that those are almost like historical, you know, from like a historical standpoint, right? Like you're helping answer questions, you're helping write the playbook for how to do this. Um, so yeah, good stuff. Final question for you. Can you nominate another brave marketer that sh we should have on the show and why that person? Yeah. So the first person that, that I can think of is, is Emily Kramer. So she's the former CMO of Carta. She's just somebody I've gotten to know really well over the past year. We actually have a syndicate together called MKT1 Collective on AngelList. We're the first marketing-led syndicate. We're trying to get more marketers into angel investing um, and invest behind us as we uh, invest into, into cool companies. And what makes her stand out? I think she's worked in some the really important brands in tech, including Carta and Asana. And she's just like a great storyteller. I really appreciate her perspective on things, having built teams at really high growth points in a company's life cycle. And yeah, she's just a lot of fun. So I'll help connect you with her. Perfect. Thank you. And Helen, how should people get in touch with you if they want to uh, reach out? Yeah, I'm one of those people that is on Twitter all day. I'm at Helen Min and you can send me a message. That's probably the best way. That's great that you got the at Helen Min uh, <laughs> handle. It's impressive. Sure. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> well, this was fun. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. We really appreciate of it. Of course. All right. Take good care. If you like what you heard today and found it valuable, it'd be super helpful if you took one minute to leave us a short review in Apple Podcasts. Every review counts in helping us to get our shows in more ears. On one final note, if you have a brand, product, or service that you'd like to get in front of Brave's 36 million users, please email us at adsales at brave.com. That's A-D-S-A-L-E-S -S at brave.com. And let us know you're a podcast listener to unlock one of the two perks. If your budget is under 10,000 a month, we'll bump you up to the top of our self-serve waiting list. Or if your budget is $10,000 a month or over, you qualify for our 25% podcast listener discount. Again, email ad sales at brave.com. And finally, musical credit goes to my older brother, Ari Devoren. His music and inspiration is a pleasure to listen to every day. And until next time, we'll talk to you then.